the opioid crisis. Uh, this is something that I've been speaking about for, I think, six or seven years now. And really, no matter where I go, uh, no matter what the group is or what the main presentation is that I'm giving to the economics club, uh, to the Republican club, to the Kiwanis uh, organization, church groups, uh, my own classes at Auburn University, uh, they get uh, a miniature lex uh, lecture at least on the opioid crisis. And I think this is of truly vital importance that everybody get as much information on this because people are losing sons and daughters, mothers and fathers all over the uh, country at a very alarming rate. Uh, and this is something, this is an issue with no quick uh, answers or solutions. Um, it's a very difficult and it's causing pain, economic pain, um, and pain in families uh, all across the nation. And it's a difficult talk to give. Um, on the run up to that, let me just give you a quick overview because I didn't get to speak at the Summer Fellows uh, session, but I did my dissertation on the economics of prohibition, illegal drugs, illegal alcohol, and other things um, in the 1980s. And I wrote extensively on that subject for well over a decade in terms of books, in terms of articles, popular and academic, chapters and books on reforming drug laws, um, and, and so I, in newspaper articles, um, of course, for publications that the Institute has, like the free market, and I up today um, with uh, our website. And in the late 1990s, I started changing my research agenda and what I was talking about. Um, in the late 1990s, I started writing about the economics of Richard Cantillon, the first economic theorist. Um, I started writing about the economics of, of American slavery with a PhD student of mine from Auburn University. And I was also writing on economic history and the history of economic thought. So I really had changed my whole perspective and what I was reading about. Um, and it wasn't about drugs anymore. In 2006, I noticed that Rush Limbaugh was arrested for Oxycontin and overusing. He was addicted to it. It was a bad scene. And at the time uh, that I remember uh, from the late 1990s, there were about three overdose deaths in America per 100,000 people. So it was about 2.8 people per 100,000 dying from opioid overdoses. By the time Rush Limbaugh was arrested, it was over six people per 100,000, so roughly doubling um, in about seven or eight years. In 2012, I start, the, the numbers were continuing to rise, and that's when I started talking to groups, whether they liked it or not, um, about the horrors and dangers and deceptions of the opioid crisis. In 2014, fentanyl, which is an artificial opioid, uh, deaths from using that started to skyrocket in 2014. Um, the latest reporting period, 2016, there were 55,000 overdose deaths attributed to various opioids, legal and illegal. So in that year, more people died from taking pills and smoking opioids then died during, American soldiers died during the Vietnam War of over a dozen years. So that's a 400% a increase in the number of overdose deaths due to opioids. And one of the reasons I left the war on drug research was because I thought we were winning. I thought there was already in place a movement towards more freedom and less drug warring. The pinnacle of the war on drugs 
was 1989, the late 1980s. It had started to decline. Overdoses were declining. Arrests were declining. Death uh, due to violence and murder and gunfire and that sort of thing was falling rapidly, uh, mostly due to the um, right to carry a weapon, concealed carry uh, permits. So I basically uh, got back into this game and started writing about it again, started talking about it again, um, about this uh, massive problem. And with the legal opiates, what we're talking about things like Oxycontin, Vicodin, and there are several others, but Oxycontin and Vicodin are the most prominent forms of legal opioids. Uh, the reason, I mean, oh, that's the whole purpose of this lecture, is to explain why we have this crisis and what we can do about it. Basically, things started to change and get much, much worse when pharmaceutical companies started lobbying um, for new guidelines for pain medication. So they were arguing that patients needed to be relieved of pain, and they were putting pressure on this committee of scientists uh, to change the guidelines so that opioids would become a regular course of pain relief. You know, so prior to this, if you had dental surgery or you had an injury or bro broken bones, typically they give you a non-opioid pain medication in the 80s and 90s. Um, but since 2000, uh, the number of prescriptions for opioids has been, uh, has skyrocketed. So the guidelines were changed by the committee, the Committee on Pain um, Prescription Drug Use, um, and physicians were encouraged to follow those guidelines. So physicians who would very rarely ever uh, issued prescriptions for opioids uh, started to do so on a regular basis. So just regular painful injuries and procedures, so if you threw out your shoulder, you broke your arm, uh, you twisted your knee, you had dental surgery, uh, for a whole host of things, uh, opioids became the standard treatment um, but typically those things were only prescribed in the short run. So 60 or 90 days, 30 days, uh, you'd be given uh, maybe 30-day prescription for 60 pills or 90 pills, uh, something like that. Now, as a result, many people became addicted to these things. And deaths now, just for the legal prescription opioids, is in excess of 15,000 per year. So the prescription uh, pain guidelines changed in the year 2000. As of the year 2012, there were 250 million prescriptions written in that year. Of the people who got those prescriptions, 25% of the prescribed users uh, quote-unquote, misused their prescription. Now, that can mean many things. Uh, you took too many pills in a day. You took uh, too many pills in a week. Um, you didn't take your pills at all. Um, all of those things could be classified as misuse. But if you had something as dangerous as opioids and the people who were supposed to be taking them misused them in some way or another 25% of the time, I would think you'd want to stop and rethink things. 10% of those people with those prescriptions got opioid use disorder, which means they became temporarily or long-term addicted uh, to the, the product. As we're going to see, 5% of the people in 2012 transitioned over to heroin. And we're talking about people who would never, ever consider taking heroin, or buying anything on the black market. <clears throat> so right now, we're, we've ended up with about 2.5 million 
opioid addicts in our country. Part of this is related to the issue of chronic pain, something I'm certainly not an expert on, but I do want to mention a few uh, facts regarding this uh, because it, that this is another epidemic that is left undiscussed and uh, unanalyzed and unsolved. In 2003, there were 13 studies on chronic pain of European countries. And the rate of chronic pain in Europe varied from 10% or 10.1% to 55% in these European countries. In 2006, chronic pain in 15 European countries in Israel averaged 19%. 2011, chronic pain um, in America was 111 million people. This is kind of hard to believe. Um, and that suggests about 50% of adults claim to be in some state of chronic pain. I looked on Google and in 2016, there were 46 million hits for chronic pain. In 2017, that rose to 163 million Google hits as a result of chronic pain or related to chronic pain. So one thing's for sure, we got to figure that issue out eventually. But for today, we're going to look mostly at this opioid problem. The face of heroin addicts is also changed. And this is very important. It makes sense with the broader um, presentation here. In the 1960s and the 1970s, the face of heroin addicts was young, inner city, mostly minority men, and Vietnam veterans. In the 1980s and 1990s, the face of heroin addiction transitioned to older African-American men, more suburban users, but there were still many young, poor, and minority males dominating the face of heroin addiction. Today, the fastest growing proportion of the heroin population is female, older, middle class, and white. And it's also more rural than urban. So the, the kernel of the story here is that the pharmaceutical companies got the prescription guidelines changed. Doctors started prescribing opioids on a massive level. A certain percentage of those people would become addicted. And they would all subsequently, or most subsequently, be cut off from their prescription. So if the reason for your prescription wasn't chronic pain, but was rather uh, falling down the stairs, getting hurt at work, having a football injury in high school, uh, with those people, you'd get 30 or 60 days, the leg would heal, the shoulder would heal, and you would get cut off. And the people would go back to their doctor and say, well, I need another prescription, please. Nervously, of course. And they would be told, no, you can't have any. Your arm is no longer broken. There's no need for you to be, ha to be continuing to take opioids. And so what do you do at that point? Well, you can buy these pills on the black market, but that tends to get very, very expensive. Um, the more direct routes are, you can go cold turkey, but that's extremely uh, hard to do, and I've been told is dangerous to try to do on your own. You can try drug rehabilitation uh, treatment centers, but the problem with that is, is that very often you have to give up 30 days of your time. It's incredibly expensive if you don't have good insurance, and it very often doesn't work. So the rate of relapse of people who successfully complete a rehab program, uh, a lot of people fall back into drug use. So the rehab route is very costly and not effective in most cases. Uh, the cold turkey 
is very, uh, very, very difficult and um, potentially dangerous. So the third choice is to go out and buy these pills on the black market. The problem with that choice is that a pill can be maybe $10 a pill. It can be uh, $25 a pill and even higher. And if you're, you have a habit of four or five pills a day, and Rush Limbaugh, I think, was on more than a dozen pills a day, um, that can get very expensive. You might be able to handle it at $10 for a while, but if it goes up to $30 a pill, not many people can afford that extra cash out of their income. So one of the choices that a lot of people make that they would never, ever conceivably make is to go back to the guy who, who sold you Oxycontin. Uh, he might also be selling or know somebody who is selling heroin. And heroin now is actually much cheaper than these Oxycontin pills. So if you buy a, a large quantity for individual consumption, you might get a, a dose of heroin for three or four dollars a piece. And so these fishermen, these coal miners, these high school teachers and football players who would never ever consider the idea of buying heroin as their best economic alternative. At least it is in the case of millions of people. Okay, so we've actually pushed um, these people into the black market. So what are, the, what are the causes of this problem? Well, the mainstream media will tell you it's the, the car, drug cartels, the smugglers, and the drug dealers that are responsible. They'll tell us that it's the drug addict's fault that the gateway theory that they must have been drinking or smoking pot and they ended up uh, buying heroin. Other people will blame the free market. Uh, a lot of people nowadays want to blame China because everybody wants to blame China for everything. <laughs> and most of the fentanyl is made in China and shipped into the United States. And most people actually agree that all of these things, these are the reasons for the opioid crisis. And what they're looking at is the scene. Frederick Bastiat's The Seen and the Unseen. Well, these are the things that are obvious and can be seen, but they're not the real reasons. These people who believe in these causes want more prohibition, more law enforcement, locking up more and more people uh, in government intervention to, to uh, solve the problem. The real reason is what I've just given you, is that the pharmaceutical industry uh, the medical industry is really at the root of this problem, um, that its uh, government intervention in various forms have basically taken the control over pain and pain treatment away from doctors and have basically set up guidelines and systems and incentives so that if patients are surveyed now, by insurance companies, by Medicare, Medicaid, um, are you getting sufficient pain relief? Well, it turns out, no, most people are not getting uh, sufficient pain relief. And so if they're not, the insurance companies and Medicare will actually penalize them with a lower compensation rate uh, from the insurance companies and from Medicare uh, and other sources. So it's not the free market at all. In fact, it's the uh, polar opposite uh, of the market. It's government intervention uh, on a massive scale. And I would argue that the best way, uh, in contrast to these other people that I've mentioned, uh, who want to lock more people up, I would argue that drug legalization is actually the way to solve this problem. So that as, ba as a baby step, uh, doctors should be able to prescribe their patients a maintenance dose of pharmaceutically pure heroin. Um, when you do that, you take the, the worries away from the addict. You take away the economic problem 
that addiction creates. You give the addict time uh, and stability in order to solve all of the other problems that come with drug addiction, family problems, relationship problems, job problems, the whole list of problems that are, are very difficult to do, especially if you are a heroin addict. Uh, by legalizing drugs and allowing doctors to prescribe pharmaceutically pure um, heroin or substitutes, I think is the first step on the way towards reversing this terrible uh, trend in American society. Thank you very much.